Let me um, situate us a little bit, and this is going to build on last week's uh, discussion, though it's um, in some ways it'll be fairly modular. What we want to do today is look at same set of issues from a different perspective, a complementary perspective. Um, that's sort of what we're going to do in any, every session. It's going to build, uh, each one's going to build on the previous ones. But like I said, be sort of modular. So one thing we established at the beginning of last week's session is that uh, the invention of the seven day week was necessarily, that is sort of scientifically, would have to have been a turning point in human history. That is prior to the first week, that is the tentative title for the book I'm writing, the first week. Prior to that first week, there was a world in which we did not know, there was, people did not have experience with the day-to-day -day rhythms that we associate, that we've associated with our entire lives with as the seven day week. There was, there were other rhythms, uh, you know, mostly having to do with uh, the lunar and, and, and solar uh, um, cycles, sometimes expressed in terms of tides, maybe uh, seasons, et cetera. But, um, and then there were, you know, holidays associated with um, uh, those cycles, but nothing like the seven day week. So to all of a sudden start to observe a social rhythm like the seven day week is a major turning point. Uh, and then eventually became something that was to the, uh, is now almost universal uh, throughout the world. And so that's a major turning point. It would have to have been a turning point. And as we said you know, in the last session, it would have been experienced by human beings as a major turning point. Now, if you look at the first three sources that I shared with you, okay, um, there is a sense in which those three sources all point to um, the same turning point. Uh, same, at least uh, um, common historical moment as being of paramount significance for the Shabbat, right? The first source is the, so last week we looked at Bayechulu, the, um, the, the Genesis is Rashid's description of the seventh day of creation, and we analyzed it. Uh, and this, what I put in this first source, you should be able to see there, is the second half of Kiddush what we say on Friday night. And what you see there is, is Chazal say uh, that um, uh, the Shabbat is uh, Zikaron HaMa'aseh Bereshit, right? Now it also says that it's Zecher L'Tziah Mitzrayim. So it looks like it's saying something about uh, the Exodus also, right? Commemorate, so it's a commemoration somehow of, 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 uh, of, of creation or a reminder of creation, the act of creation, Ma'aseh Bereshit, and it's also, um, um, and we'll come back to that, but I think most of us, when we read it, I think I, think I first did for a long time, think that um, the reminder of the Exodus that's there, Zechot Tziat Mitzrayim, is a kind of a, of a piece with all the other Kiddushes we say throughout the year, which the holiday Kiddushes, which also say, Mikrai Kodesh Zechot Tziat Mitzrayim. The holidays are somehow, because that's when you know, we start to learn about them and they're somehow commemorate the Exodus. And so maybe it's just attaching the Shabbat to that, right? And so it looks like probably in the first instance, it's really about creation. And then if you look at source two and three, right? Which I think we're, um, we're all very familiar with as well. Um, th that's the text. The first source two is the text of um, Zachor Yom HaShabbat L'Kad uh, That's the text of the fourth commandment. Um, that the, uh, from from uh, the book of Exodus, the, the Shemot's version of the fourth commandment from Parashat Yitro has the famous remember the, Sab the, 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 the seventh day. And it continues um, and concludes with, right, the reason for observing the Shabbat, which is God created the world in six days and he rested on the seventh, right? And that's why he blessed the Shabbat and he sanctified. al came berach in Yom HaShabbat uh, so it's linking Shabbat first and foremost to creation, right? We're very familiar with that. And then the source three is another text that we're familiar with. Both of them are used in some combination as part of the Shabbat morning Kiddush, right? And the second text is one we said actually just a few parshas ago um, from Parshat Kitisa. And this is just at the end of the revelation that Moshe receives on Sinai, just, a, just before the story of the golden calf. Um, there's the a really important text. We're going to come back to that again and again. We're going to come back to all these texts again and again. Um, but that is um, very important. In a, in a, it's adding some new information about the Shabbat, and particularly 
that Shabbat is a, an oat, a sign of the covenant, right? That it has the notion of brit in there for the first time, that Shabbat is somehow either is itself kind of a covenant or at least is a reminder of the covenant, a sign of the covenant, but it's a sign between Israel and God um, that um, in the, at least the, the conclusion of that, uh, of, of that paragraph, um, that, you know, so when we observe the Shabbat, the Shem Rubin Israel, the Shabbat, so does the Shabbat, there are Tambri to them, it should be a, it should be covenantal for all our generations. Um, key, again, commemorating the Exodus. Um, um, uh, what is it? Shabbat and God was sort of refreshed, whatever that means, on the seventh day. Okay, so yes, uh, these texts, so both from the Torah and then Chazal, right, in our Kiddush, our sages, and in, in, in uh, uh, putting together the Kiddush text, uh, are linking the Shabbat, um, and as we're going to say, it's Shabbat and the week, to, uh, to, to creation, but that is a problem for us a little bit, based on last week, right? It's a problem. Why? Because that's not a historical turning point. The creation of the world is not a turning point. It's the very beginning not a turning point, right? There's no pre-human history for the creation, that's for sure. So that's a problem. It goes back to the original kind of crisis I mentioned the last time that I had. Number two, we said it's not, the, the week itself is not actually, and, even, and, argue, and not really Shabbat, right? The cycle of Shabbat is not introduced at creation. Uh, only the metaphysical idea, we said it's kind of a beautiful, inspiring idea. We talked about that in the last uh, discussion, but not the week, not as a human institution. And I want to add one other thing that should bother us. Uh, in that is, especially in, in source three, right? The Vishamru, the notion of Shabbat as a kind of covenantal bond, right? Between Israel and God that harkens to creation should bother us. And the reason it should bother us is because the covenant is particularistic. It's between God and Israel, not between God and any other people, not between God and the world, but the events of the creation of the world is not even about just human beings, it's about everybody, about all creatures. And so it should strike us as weird, I think, or odd or sort of a non sequitur to root, to anchor the, uh, um, the Shabbat as a special covenant between God and Israel in creation. That should bother us, okay? So just getting us going here. I see some uh, notes in the chat. No, good. Okay, we're good. All right. Let me let me use that as a little bit of, of setup to get to the bigger problem. Okay. So here's the bigger problem. The bigger problem, very famously, comes from a comparison of source two, which is the Exodus's right, uh, the Sefer Shemot's uh, version of the fourth commandment with the version of the fourth commandment that Moshe relates in the fifth parak of um, Devarim, of Deuteronomy. And so famously, there's a couple of, there's a, a few different changes or di variations between um, the two versions of the Decalogue of the, of the Ten Commandments. Um, most of the other ones are fairly minor, but in the fourth commandment in particular, in Shabbat, there's a whole bunch of variations. And what I've done here, and you have it on your source sheets too, um, the same kind of coloring, the blue signifies um, words that are added, that are not in the original, uh, or in the in, the, in Shemot's version, we'll put it that way, okay? Um, and that includes this notion of, oh, I should have, I didn't blue everything on the, in the English, sorry. So, you know, as God, as God commanded you, that's not in the original. That's also in the third commandment in Kibbutz uh, Avayim. There's a little bit of kind of variation on, so there's, there's an additional set of animals that should, you should also rest, right? Your ox and your um, chamor, your, your donkey, your ass. Um, there's a little bit of, you know, every animal is that emphasized over here. And then there's the kind of major, major the real major variations. So one by the most famous variation, obviously, is the fact that here it's shamor. You should observe the, the, the Shabbat, whereas, um, or keep, right? And then in, in, um, in, uh, in Exodus, it's uh, uh, zachor. You should remember, you should recall, 
uh, the Exodus. You know, famously, we have in, we have the Chazal, a very famous Chazal, which is somehow those two words were said in one word, but dibur echad. And we have that as the beginning of our Lachadodi, right? Shamar v'zachor b'dibur echad, okay? Um, and that's not sure exactly what it means to hear the same word in one thing, but, but we can maybe get to that. Um, I want to focus, though, I want to put that aside for a second. So note the variation over there in terms of that first word. But what I really want to focus on is a part that we don't focus on as much. We are, there's a lot more action. <laughs> there's a lot more variation, which is the conclusion and the reason that are given here for the, um, the Shabbat. And whereas we just said that in, over in Exodus, twice really, but certainly in the fourth commandment, right? It's commemorating creation. What we have over here is um, it's pointing towards a different event in history, which is the Exodus, it seems, right? Um, it actually has got a little extra here. Um, so that your servant and your maidservant rest just as you do, a little bit of almost like maybe referencing like you, right? So there's a kind of a notion of fellowship here that's, that's added, but then it goes into language that usually strikes people. If you, if you read this language without knowing that it was coming from the fourth commandment, you would think what holidays is associated with. Pesach, right? Sounds like Pesach, right? The outstretched hand and the strong arm. Sounds like Pesach language. Does not sound like Shabbat language to us, basically, right? That's what it sounds like. Okay. Now, I want to turn your attention to source five. It's a little long, so I'll just kind of summarize it. And you can, you can take a look. The parts that I highlighted are the parts that I'm going to focus on. So there's a big debate between the Rambam and the Ramban, that is Maimonides and Nachmanides. Okay? They're, they both are bothered by the second half of this, um, by the reason that's given here, in, for the fourth commandment in Deuteronomy and Devarit. It, they're bothered generally for the same reason, which is like, how do we think about this, these kind of two reasons, okay? But if you look at, so well, I haven't, I haven't um, so the, the, the Ramban is quoting Maimonides, okay? And what he quotes Maimonides on, and he says, right, that, um, so Maimonides is str struggling with trying to understand what, uh, what's going on here? Was, I see that he's, I, I think that he's struggling. <laughs> and what he proposes is, so he focuses on, let's go back to that for a second. He really focuses on more on this addition over here. Laman yanuach avdecha So why do we observe the Shabbat? So that your servant and your maidservant, so that your male and female slave may rest as you do. And there, and then he says, basically, the rest of this kind of carries over, it's indirect, right? So what will happen if you sort of like, his idea, Rambam's idea is that what Shabbat does for us is it gets us to identify with people who basically would otherwise be, you know, basically work under us and lower down in the hierarchy who work for us or even slaves or maidservants, okay? And we come to identify kamocha like you, just like, like we said in the famous, the after the Reacha kamocha in Vayikra, right? And you should roll your neighbor as yourself. And the idea is that this will come to like, so the exodus comes indirectly from that, right? That will come to sort of reminded of the exodus by identifying with the plight or the situation, the standing of a servant or a slave, okay? Um, and that's how he handles the, this business about remembering the exodus, which otherwise seems weird to him. Like, where did the exodus come up? That's how I think that's going on. And Nachmanides says in response, so this is not the only time that Nachmanides basically says, Rambam, what do you, you know, uh, what's up? I don't get this, what you, we have to say here. He says, this is not clear to me at all. That's, what he, that's the part that I've underlined over there, if you can see it. This is not clear. He says, nobody remembers the Exodus this way. This is not like, he's saying, and, and he, he tries to put on like a neutral objective perspective. He says, if I were to see somebody I mean, resting and giving their servant and their maid servant to rest, their workers to rest, that wouldn't make me think of the Exodus. It doesn't do that. And so he says, 
he's, so he's not saying that's wrong, right? Like there's something right maybe there, but he's saying actually it's more direct, right? So it's saying it's not simply kind of carrying over from the uh, the fact that you're identifying with your, you know, you're basically giving your slave and your maidservant to, to, to rest. It's more direct. It's saying, no, 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 it really does remind you of the Exodus directly. Why? And he's saying, or, or indirectly in a different kind of way, he's saying through the first commandment. Right, so the first commandment is, I am the Lord, your God, who took you out of Egypt, right? So it's, that's how God announces um, himself to, the, the, to Israel. And that's true, same, exact the same words, I think, uh, in uh, Devarim as in, as in um, Shemot, in Deuteronomy as in, as in Exodus, all right? And he's saying, it's actually a little bit kind of theological. What will happen is, okay, he's saying, you observe Shabbat. And you're told it makes you you're supposed to be mindful of creation, of God the Creator. And guess what? You might have doubts about that. You might have doubts about God the Creator. Not so surprising. Uh, people have doubts about that. But then you remember the Exodus, where God the Creator revealed Himself, intervened in history, and did it in a way that made us believe in God the Creator. And that's the connection to the to, to the Exodus. So it's, it is in the experience of Shabbat that makes you think of the Exodus, okay? Now, I wanna I'll, I'll pause in a second. Let me just conclude one of the, let me just note really important areas of agreement between Maimonides and Nachmanides here. And then also kind of things that they add. And then I'm gonna sort of say, you know, who I think is right. We're gonna, get, we're gonna move on from there. We're gonna, um, and it's gonna get us, I think, some, some really important. So first, I think I want to notice something that's really important. So I'm using the term complementary reapplication. And that's kind of a stitch together. Those are two words that Joshua Berman uses, Rabbi Dr. Joshua Berman, in his book um, from a couple of years ago. He's actually two books on this, but one in particular, highly recommended, called Inconsistency in the Torah. And among the things that he um, deals with very, very, very creatively and persuasively is on the differences between um, when there are differences between the book of Deuteronomy and Devarim and early parts of the Torah. And in general, the approach is to suggest that uh, it's a common, actually, literary convention at that time uh, in history, uh, but certainly in the Torah, for a later perspective, a later speaker, to give sort of their spin on earlier events or earlier laws that are an application to, so it's complementary, it's kind of a different but compatible take on the same thing that is more meaningful for the, the, the audience, uh, their, 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 their listeners at that time. And in particular, there's something different about the experience of the second generation, uh, the people in the 40th year, which is when Moshe is speaking in Dvarim, and the experience of during the Exodus itself uh, in or at Sinai, which is in the first year. Okay, and then there's a sense in which both um, Rambam and Ramban seem to be attuned to that. They're not really bothered by the difference of emphasis. They're kind of saying that makes sense given who the, the hearers are in that generation and in later generations and how they'll experience the Shabbat. That's what Moshe is attuned to, number one. Number two, they're both kind of agreeing that, and this is, there's a lot, you've, um, I'm sure people, a lot of people on the call are familiar with this, with sort of creation themes or God the creator themes um, in the Exodus, um, in both, you know, sort of the themes and the literary presentation of um, Yitziat Mitzrayim, or the experience in Egypt and of the Makot, etc. And they're both kind of agreeing about that as well. Okay, so there's something about. Um, and then I think they're each adding something very important, right? So one is, Rambam is, Rambam is noticing, Maimonides is noticing that part of the reason here that's given is not historical. It's actually sort of thematic. And it's about kind of hierarchy and the master servant relationship and how we should basically in the first principles kind of like, uh, you know, transcend it somehow. And the Shabbat is an opportunity for transcending it, for transcending a master servant relationship. I mean, so this is a moment for us to identify with people lower than the people that we dominate, right? And the people who are lower down us in the hierarchy. And that's trans-historical, right? But even if historical moments might have been really important for that and our experience in Egypt in particular. And um, Nachmanides is adding that actually, you know, the history is important here, right? So going back to that first commandment, right? There's an experience that is in history and in particularly the Exodus itself. And there's something about the Shabbat experience somehow, some way 
that reminds us of the Exodus. And that's what he's emphasizing as well. All right, now I'm gonna build on that in a second. Um, any, let me stop there for a second. Questions, concerns? Um, yeah, that's the book. Thank you, Anita. Inconsistency in the Torah by Joshua Berman. There's another book um, that he wrote that I think is, oh, the problem with Inconsistency in the Torah is that it's super expensive, crazy expensive. Like it's published by Oxford and they have a whole business model, which is like real regular people don't read these books. We're just gonna basically make libraries buy them. And that's a very unfortunate business model. But there is a book from Magid called Ani Mamin, um, which is, um, I had not read it though. So I think a lot of these themes are in that book, but I have not read it. Um, maybe someone else has, they could say. All right, let me show you some, let me build on this a little bit without, um, I want, I'm not totally confident you're with me. So I wanna make sure that the uh, people should raise your hands um, or even to shout out or something like that if something is bothering you, okay? But let me, let me give a little bit more on this. All right, I wanna say the Rambam, the Ramban, sorry, Nachmanides, so he's the one who basically thinks there's more to the historical basis that is pointing at the Exodus, that he is a lot more right <laughs> um, on that. There's a lot more evidence that supports the Ramban uh, that he may not, he may have been aware of, may wasn't aware of, I don't know. And so let me point you now to sources 6A through 6D, okay? It looks like so far, no one's saying they can't find this. So you're, you're following. Okay. Now, what you see in these sources, okay, are the four other times in the book of Deuteronomy, in Devarim, that the formula, the expression, ki eved ha'ita and you will or you shall. And by the way, that the Hebrew is always going to is ambiguous about this. Is it a will or a shall? But it's certainly a good thing. So it's maybe a you know should shall. Um, remember your experience as ser slaves in Egypt. So it's the same beginning, slight variations on that, right? Sometimes it says Be'eretz Mitzrayim, and sometimes right in the land of Egypt, and sometimes it says in Egypt, right? Um, and then it's got, in each one of those four occasions, um, the commemoration of, um, of slavery in Egypt, our experience, and then redemption, right? Each one is about redemption. Um, is connected to a mitzvah, to a commandment, just like Shabbat. There are actually five in total occasions in Tvarim, and these are four. Okay, oh, so I was going to ask a question, but you'll see. So let me show you. Um, if you look at them carefully, what you'll notice is each one. So it's a formula, but as the Torah often does, it's, got, it's very, very, very precise in the language that it's using, and it varies that formula very precisely. Right, so one of them says something about the land of Egypt, right? The Eretz Mitzrayim, which that's the one about Leket, right? It's um, Peat, uh, right? Uh, um, it's it, Leket and Peah. It's about um, leaving aside uh, leave, leavings on the field and leaving a corner of the field for uh, 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 the poor, right? And for you know for widows and, and, and the poor. And it makes sense that it's emphasizing the land because that's about the land. And if you look at each one of them. They're very finely tuned to, to the mitzvah, to the commandment they're about, okay? So it's not arbitrary. It's very, very precise in the language. And the second thing I want you to notice for our purposes is really key, is that none of them have that Pesach language that we're familiar with. None of them say anything about the Exodus process, right? They talk about redemption, right? Um, but they don't say anything about, and God, you know, put out his 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 uh, strong arm and the outstretched hand, that kind of thing, right? Strong hand, the outstretched arm. Sorry, I got that backwards. That's not in them. Only in the Shabbat. So what that says to me is, so first of all, so sort of like doubling down on this notion of complementary um, reapplication. This formula is a Moshe formula for teaching the people how to understand the roots of these various mitzvot that all have to do with taking care of the poor, taking care of the weak, et cetera, relating to that. So the Rambam is not wrong that it relates to that. But uniquely, this one, the Shabbat, is pointing to the whole process of the Exodus, not just slavery in Egypt, okay? 
People see that? All right, so I think that kind of like reinforces the idea that it's actually about the Exodus process itself that this fourth commandment, that Moshe is pointing to in the fourth commandment. Not only that, but if you look at sources 7a, b, and c, you'll see more evidence for this, okay? The first one is from the, these are, so um, 7a and 7b are two really important mentions of Shabbat in uh, the, the in, in um, later parts of Nach, so after the Torah and other parts of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, they're both put in a historical context. They're the only times that's done where Shabbat is described as an ancient institution. I would say also, I'll say this in my book, for historical or scientific purposes, these mentions are very important because they describe the Shabbat. And here again, I would say it's not just the Shabbat, it's the seven day week as an ancient institution um, in, in each book, it's described in that way. And these are books that are written, they're situated at least, right? In, so Yechezkel, we're talking about around, you know, somewhere around the time of, um, you know, the Babylonian exile, right? Uh, that he's writing. Uh, and Nehemiah, like the return, right? So you're talking about the middle of the first millennium BCE, and they're describing Shabbat as an ancient institution. And they both point to the Exodus. For it. And by the way, here's a chazal that we all know and love. We all know that we sing this song just at a, uh, you know, a month from now. If you look at source 7c, that's Dayenu. And we sing this every single year. And do we think about what it says? It's describing Natalano et Shabbat, right? Right after Hechilano et Taman. That's what it's saying, just like Nehemia does. Nehemia does it, he flips it a little bit. But basically, it's describing the Shabbat. So they're not even describing Shabbat as part of the Exodus. It's describing at a particular moment in the Exodus, right? Which is, and so the, here's the, so here is a quote from a, from a book that most people think is kind of a throwaway children's book. And it's actually fantastic. And, and I bet many of you have this book on your shelves. Maybe, maybe some of you have valued as much as I do. Uh, it's an underrated classic by um, Rabbi, Rabbi Ari Kaplan Zetzal. Uh, this was he was he was the uh, chief educator for NCSY, uh, and that's this was given away to many kids, uh, and people have it on their shelves. I found it on my shelf one day when I started doing this project. I said, "What is this book?" My wife had I think she had actually from school. She was in NCSY. It was just sitting on our shelf. I was like, "What is this book?" And I opened it up, and I just begun this project, and I read this, and I'm like, "Oh, genius!" Ari Kaplan knew it. Well, I don't know how he knew this. I haven't thought of how I how he knew this. But he is basically pointing us not just to the Shabbat. So he, here's his answer to the question of why Shabbat can be both Zikaron Lamase Breshid, commemorating creation, and it can be um, somehow commemorating Exodus. He's saying it's not simply that it reminds us of Exodus in some way. He's saying that it was given as part of the Exodus. Not just, and he's saying not just the, the day of Shabbat, but the week itself. Notice this key point here, the last thing. This also answers another question. How do we know which day was the Sabbath? Oops, one second, I'm in a room that has an infrared. There we go. How do we know which day was the Sabbath? Who counted it for the time of creation? All right, and the point is, nobody did. Instead, it was introduced in Exodus 16, that's source eight, okay? And that is gonna be the most important source for us. And it's the most important text. I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about it a lot over the next few weeks. So this is, um, so that's the text we should focus on the most. It is, like I said, source 18, uh, source eight, okay? And this is a description of the first Shabbat, the first week in the Torah. Uh, I've over the years asked people, and I said, okay, so once I, I said, you know, where is the first week in the Torah? And people often will say creation. And then I'll say, nope, because pay attention. There's no noun, as we said last week. There's a lot of, there's a bunch of other reasons, but that's the main reason. There's no human experience of the Shabbat. There's no cycle. And I said, where does that first show up? Where do they first learn about the Shabbat? 
And a lot of people will say, well, at Sinai, it must be at Sinai, because they think, well, yeah, there's no Shabbat in the rest of Breshit. There's no Shabbat. That's true. And for some reason, people sort of forget that actually um, the Shabbat, even though we have, you know, the two challahs on our table um, on Friday night and Shabbat, you know, and Shabbat morning and Shabbat lunch, and those are supposed to be commemorating the double portion of manna that we received on the sixth day. But people forget, I think, that that actually is a few weeks prior to Sinai in the Exodus description, right? So the story is after the crossing of the sea, after Shirat Hayam and the song and all that, uh, they then, they, they, they basically then, it's the, uh, the, the beginning of the, um, the second month. So it's a month, uh, actually it's, it's a, yeah, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a month after the Exodus and they go out into the open wilderness and then they panic. And then there's a response, which is God rains food on them for six days. And then double portion of the seventh day, they don't know what's going on. And then God, Moshe explains to them, you know, basically store this for tomorrow. Can't store on the other days. You could store for tomorrow. That is the Torah's presentation of the first experience of the Shabbat. And it's part of the Exodus. Now, you might say, right? So here's a question. I'll, let me stop in a second. So we're doing on time. Okay. You might ask the question. Someone should ask this question. I'm a little worried that we're not. Um, oh, Judith does not have the sources. Can um, Judith, are you able to see? I can put them on, though, if you just follow, if you, let's see, Kayla just, uh, Kayla just shared them. Can you, Judith, you're not able to click on, I see, maybe you can, um, if you don't want to see them on the screen, is that the, is that the issue? Okay, let me see if I can, um, let me just make a few points and then I'll share. I think it'll be, uh, if, you, if you just open a Tanakh actually and just look at Exodus 16, Shmot, uh, tet, tet Zion, that'll basically get you a lot of what you need. That's all, that's all you need. The rest of it, I think, will be fairly clear. All right. Now, you might are ask, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. This is a few weeks or a month after the Exodus, right? So maybe, maybe, maybe this is actually not part of the Exodus process. But actually, so let me, do, let me actually do what you asked. Let me show my screen, and I'll show you a few things. Uh, one second here. Thanks for letting me know. I didn't realize that you weren't able to see it. Uh, I'll share. Oops, second here. I go. I see. There we are. Ah, Judith, good. You have a chumash now. What I'll do is, if you have a chumash, then I'll, I'll basically point to them. Ozzy is asking, are there not midrash stream that say Jews observe Shabbat before the Exodus? Yes. Um, a vote in particular. There are midrashim like that. So I, I kind of talk about this. I, I can maybe we'll get to that at the end. Um, again, the main thing I'd say about that is um, uh, it's, it, there, there are various ways to come at that. I mean, if you really want to think of the midrashim as making an historical point that these are meant to be taken literally, what you can sort of say is that somehow the Avot had um, some notion, had some cycle and they had Shabbat and then that it was lost in some way. Uh, something like that. Uh, and I've seen that proposed. Otherwise, I think you need to think about that sort of as being allegorical in some way. Um, uh, otherwise, it kind of like, why does the Torah tell us about it? Which is, a, which is a question I think you need to ask about any kind of midrash like that. Um, by the way, there's another great midrash. Um, uh, a few months before the Exodus, they were no longer enslaved. I don't know what you mean by that. Um, I think what you mean, so maybe what you mean, Ozzy, you can also unmute if you like. I think what you mean, there's a great, there's a really um, interesting midrash in, in Shmot Rabban, which describes Moshe proposing to Paro um, that they get this, um, um, the Hebrew slaves to rest every seven days. And, um, and then he, uh, good, okay, so that's what you're asking about. Yes, so the problem with that actually, and then what happens is, um, that Paro uh, cancels it when he, the things get out of hand. This is based on what happens. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, to me, that is actually a, an amazing midrash. And it suggests the midrash is telling, teaching us 
that the Shabbat is an invention, that the week is an invention. Uh, and that's basically, what, but I can say more about that, but I'm a little worried about the time. But basically, I think we need to think about those as basically telling us something about the, about the meaning of the Shabbat rather than the history of it, okay? Because uh, otherwise it like, you know, it potentially contradicts the actual text itself, right? So I don't think that's what we, we wanna believe. All right, let me, um, let me get back to this one second. All right, okay. So um, I wanna, you know what, let me just skip, I'm gonna skip a piece because I wanna get to something more important than what I have next. Let me get to this one second. So I wanna say there's a lot of evidence and I'll just go through this. I'll just put this all out on, this, on the screen, okay? And we're because we're going to come back to these issues um, in the next couple of weeks. That so, if you think, wait a second, this story of the man and Shabbat is actually after the Exodus. There's a lot of reasons to think that actually no, it's intrinsic to the Exodus process. One thing is if you look at um, in source eight, if you look at um, uh, pasuk lamed bet, that is uh, Exodus sixteen thirty two, you'll see. That what Moshe tells Aaron is to store the, the man as a keepsake to remind us this is the bread that our forefathers ate while, when they, God took them out of Egypt. Therefore, this is part of the Exodus process. In fact, later on, environment also describes the whole 40 years as part of the Exodus process. Okay. Number two, we'll talk about this next, next session a whole bit, that this nar narrative is actually prompted by and motivated by memories of Egypt. So if you look at the first verse, right, it's that they're remembering it's, it's been a month since they come out of Egypt. And then it says, why are we out be being to be killed? Um, why didn't God kill us back when we were in Egypt? Okay. And then in verse six in Pasuk Bav, you'll see it says, Moshe is saying, aha, now you're going to get to know through this process what comes next, you're going to get to finally really know that God is responsible for taking you out of Egypt. So it's all about the Exodus process. All right. I'm going to actually skip um, what I have to say here in source 9, 10, 11. I'll leave it. You'll have these slides. You can see them. I'm going to come back to them. But and they basically make the point in various ways. The Shabbat experience, the man and the Shabbat, the manna and, and, the, and the Shabbat are deeply connected to or building on aspects of the exodus process okay and i'll come back to those points um and maybe even tonight if i have the point i want to i want to actually um come to the second part of this okay um okay so i'm gonna skip this one too and just show you something up so if you look at source 12 and 13 okay what source and 12 and 13 do for us is they give us another angle on the whole zahor and shamor thing Okay, so wait, so I should tell you, um, Judith, can you see that? Uh, let, me, let me bring that up because I'm not saying where that is. Let me do that one second here. I'll bring that up so you can see 12 to 13. Okay. I, saw, I saw text before and now it's disappeared. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, oh, you saw text before. I'm bringing this right here so you can see the actual, um, can you see the uh, source sheet now? Yes, do, yes, do, do, do. thank okay. you. So notice what you see over here. Let me just zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. Um, what you should be able to see now is this is from the end of the description of their experience in Egypt, okay? This is in Exodus uh, 12, right? Notice the words here, Zachor et ayom azesh, tem in Mitzrayim. Remember, and this is talking about, this is in the context of describing, right? Uh, the, whole, well, the set of mitzvot, the set of commandments that come from, uh, that have to do with the Exodus experience in Egypt. Remember that day, um, that's a Zachor. And now look over here. This is now in Dvarim, okay? Same exact text, same exact uh, moment. Keep a Chodesh Aviv in the, um, describing again the, the, the past glam, et cetera. And look at the language that opens it with. Shamor et Chodesh Aviv. Oops, sorry, something just popped up. Okay, this is about Pesach. So back to the screen. So it's interesting. Again, Exodus has it as Zachor. Um, 
uh, Deuteronomy has it as, as Shamar, okay? So ben Jacob basically points out that anytime you see Zachor, ben Jacob, um, uh, early 20th century, uh, a brilliant Bible scholar, you'll see Nechama Leibovitch citing him a lot. Uh, very, very interesting biography. Um, reform, very uh, fiercely anti-Zionist, um, but also fiercely um, brave uh, fighter of anti-Semites, uh, reform rabbi from Germany. Very, very interesting guy. Um, and brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, Tanakh uh, um, interpreter. And he points out anytime you see Zachor the Torah, it actually is referring to a, a particular historical moment, um, not just in the abstract. Um, that's important to what it's doing. And it's certainly doing it there in, uh, it's doing it in, um, with respect to Pesach. And he basically says it's doing it with, with Shabbat too. Um, and there we are, uh, bring that back up. And so that's another aspect of the Zachor and Shamor also is actually about the Zachor is saying, remember the Exodus actually. And the Shamor is basically saying, um, you know, it's, it's effectively, oh, what he says basically is that like, uh, it's, point, it's emphasized, so the Zachor really is the remembering part of the Exodus is in the second half of the fourth commandment. Um, and then here it's emphasizing the, you don't have to remember the, the, the specific experience of the Exodus anymore. You just have to worry about uh, of observing it the way that God wants you to observe it. All right, last piece I wanna show you. This goes back to what Ari, Rob, Ari Kaplan was emphasizing. The second thing he mentions here, besides the fact that it's the experience of the Shabbat of the man, that that's what the Torah means as when it's, and what Chazal mean when they say Zechel Yitzyam Mitzrayim, the commemorating the Exodus. He also says something else that's really important. He says the miracle of the manna paralleled the miracle of creation. Okay? So I want to ask you what he might mean by that. So if you look through source eight, right? So this is again, this is just Shmot, uh, Shmot uh, 16, right? Shmot Tedzayin, okay? And this is gonna be, like I said, sort of our or text, our most important text. What about that? And you can, you can unmute or you can put it in the chat. Uh, we'll do that this way. What about that story? Reminds you of the experience of creation or God the creator? In what ways does it remind you of, does it make you think of creation? I see something in the chat. Okay, manna comes from heaven and lands on Haaretz. Right, so Ozzy, I guess you can't unmute because you seem to be just using text. Why does that remind you of creation? Well, I'll-, I'll Because-, I'll, because uh... yeah. Good. Oh, interesting. I like that, actually. It wasn't what I was thinking of. But that's interesting. So there's a Shemaim Va'aretz part of it. Very interesting. Yeah, makes sense. Um, you're getting heavens and, and earth uh, in the story, right? And they're kind of good. I like that. So that's that's creation one, right? It's the first story of, of, of creation. And, and, other, and we got God sees from working. We, what's COI? I think COI to me means conflict of interest. That can't mean what you mean, Robert, right? <laughs> Children of Israel. Oh, I see. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, okay. So we work for six days. So in this case, we're acting like God, right? There's kind of an, there's a B'Tselem Elohim going on here, which is actually an important theme in that first creation story that we are meant to somehow emulate God. And that's one aspect of this. We work for six days. We stop on the seventh, right? Interestingly, also, God creates something new for six days and stops on the seventh, right? Okay. What else? What else seems like the experience of creation or the uh, notion of God, the creator, somehow coming through? What makes us I think don't know. I don't know but, if this is what you're getting at at all, but not. I, I well, I already got not, one that I wasn't thinking of. I don't. It's not. I'll tell you what I think, but I want to hear what you think. Yeah, good. 
not having the man, not having the mana was, uh, that's how you could tell it's uh, Shabbat, even if we didn't quite know yet what that meant. But the point is that the non thing, the non thing, the, the non being, the non presence, just yeah. like Shabbat is all about not doing. So that's okay, how good. it was oh, like a time marker. So interesting, related to what I shared last week, there's something about, so something about the absence of something becoming something, right? It's becoming something important uh, somehow through its absence, the lack of creation becoming a, becoming a something. Absolutely. Saul Berman has a terrific essay from years ago about, about that. Um, the Sabbath defined that way. It's stayed with me ever since. Very I'm sure I'm, Thank you. I'm sending a little of that back out. All right, great. All right, and so Ozzy's saying mana is yesh meaning you know creation ex nihilo of some kind. I don't get into debates about, um, but yeah, new creation every day. All right. Any other thoughts? I'll show you what, what I have to share, and then uh, if people. All right. So I think what's interesting about so those are great. Um, here is a bit um, that I would share, is that you can see themes both from creation one, meaning the seventh day is creation and creation two that show up here in really interesting ways. So mostly I think what we just mentioned were um, creation one themes, right? Where God is a creator and maybe we are becoming like little creators and we do what God does, okay? The most important verse in this whole thing, and if I've accomplished anything to get you to, is it for imitatio day is, um, is verse 1630, I think it is, um, Pasuk Lamed, which is Vaish Botaam, no, Vaish Batu, Vaish Batu Haam Bayomashvi. Is that right? Am I getting it right? Yes. Okay, there's a Pasuk, right? It's the climactic verse. So, as we'll talk about it next week, right? They have trouble observing the Shabbat. It's a, it's a, there's sins going on in the story, right? There, there's turmoil. They, they, you know, first they go out and they, um, you know, they don't listen to Moshe. Uh, they gather, right? They don't eat right away. He's got to tell them, pay, eat, right? Then they go and gather it. Uh, you know, um, they try to gather it, you know, etc. cetera, okay? Um, and, but by the end of the story, Vaishpatuha am bayomashvi. That verse should remind us of a very important verse. What verse does it remind us of? Where else do we have a verse that sounds like that? Well, we read it last week. Yeah, okay. Everyone's like, that's maybe too obvious. Right. So I would put to you that I don't know of any other pair of verses in the Torah where the people of Israel or anyone is doing exactly what God does, except maybe Vaidever Moshe, but certainly not the collective people like Vaidever Hashem Moshe anymore. That moment, very simple verse, and the people Sabbath on the seventh day is them emulating God. Okay. Now, I'm going to say the, on the second column, how are we doing on time? I'm going to notice. All right, we're doing fine. Yep, you're um, doing fine. Yeah. So there's, there's a whole bunch of elements here that are really important that are the experience of creation or the experience of God, the creator. So we are little creators, and particularly by Shpetuha and by Yomashvi, or we work six days, we stop on the seventh, the gold goes together. And we experience creation for six days and stop on the seventh. And then if you look on the other column, what I'm pointing to is, oh, this is, by the way, Ozzy, what I thought, uh, who was it who said, yeah, there's a God reigning sustenance on us, Bayam Ter, that language, that first shows up at the very beginning of creation too. Um, him tir, right? So the beginning of the cre second creation story is this, you know, basically this kind of wasteland before God starts to reign on, on it, Beterim him tir, okay? The other thing I think is really important, we'll come back to this also, is, um, well, let me say the most obvious thing, I think, actually, right, which is um, the story of the Garden of Eden revolves around a sin, an, an edict, right, by God. Do not eat from a particular location, 
right? So God is giving you to eat. You pick from the, from the trees, just like here. You're picking God-given food, okay? But do not eat from a particular tree. Here, it's not a space that's walled off, but time that's walled off, right? Okay. And there's another part of it here is, this is a very important um, theme here, which is about no storage. No storage, no more movable property. So they have to live in this world where they can't, they basically are dependent completely on God. They don't know where their bread is coming from day to the next. And then they're given a little space for that to observe a Shabbat. But again, they don't have any food to the next. They got to learn, do not all of a sudden, oh, because you get a little extra food, don't hoard it, eat it, okay? What that does is it creates, a sense, and remember, there's, there's the miracles, which I uh, don't have in here. They're, they're, they're really the miracles of, didn't matter how much you collected, every person got exactly what they write. What that does is creates an experience of radical equality, okay? And fellowship, everyone's doing kind of the same thing. They're basically naked before God in a sense, like, like Adam and Eve in that sense. There's no property there either. They're kind of all equal, I would argue, okay? There's another part of it too, which is that sin again, revolves around divine knowledge. And as I mentioned before, and I didn't have enough time, I think to mention it, I'll, I'll come back to it. Right, this whole experience is meant to impart knowledge, and so if you look at which source today, I'll just go back so you can see it, where it's mentioned. So I know. Ah, where did it go? Uh, how did I get to the very beginning? That's weird. Um, okay, if you, yeah, if you look at um, source ten, this is you can it'll be on the tape and you can look at it. This describes the plan of the Exodus. This is the beginning of Parshat Vayera in um, uh, chapter six, verse seven, vidatem, and you will come to know God somehow through this process. Nowhere else does it mention that this happens other than here. Both first Moshe mentions, then God mentions it. That's particularly in, if you look at um, Pasuk Yudbet, God says, through this process, you'll come to know, you'll come to know me, Okay. And so similarly, like in the Eitz Hadat, Tovera, with the, the tree of knowledge, somehow the experience of this kind of walled off um, you know, area, of, um, in this case, time, um, where God provides sustenance is um, a way of acquiring knowledge of God, this experience, okay? In this case, you're actually invited to, to, to learn uh, to, to know God. In that case, it was walled off from them from not to know God, all right. I'm gonna leave, um, I'm gonna add one last piece here, which is important, okay? Which is, not only is it an experience of creation, but it's also a story of invention. We'll come back to that. So if you look through again, source eight, this parak, what you'll see is, A, this is the first time they're experiencing the week as you know, human beings are experiencing the week, okay? Number two, notice how very uniquely this is a story of people being utterly bewildered. First, they're bewildered by this food. What the heck is this? And they give it this weird name, a neologism. Neologisms are a very good sign that something very weird is happening. Oh, I mentioned, I think I mentioned on the previous slide, right? That's another way they're actually reenacting the second story of creation. They're naming something. That's um, one of Adam's uh, first roles, right? They name God's cre creations. That's what's going on here as well. Okay. Um, they also seem not to understand or to trust this new thing, just like we usually do with new inventions. We often do uh, with, with new inventions, especially ones that kind of disturb our whole you know, way of living. It's weird for us. We don't know how to react to it. To the point, we have to be told to actually see it. This goes to what Robert was sharing before. Very importantly, Robert, I think it's a really nice connection, actually. If you look at um, verse 29, which we'll come back to. Moshe says, hold on, ru, uh, I'm sorry, God says, ru, ki Hashem natan lachem the Shabbat. Pay attention, look, observe. God has given you this Shabbat, right? And you should, it's for you, not for God. They think at first, it seems, they think it's Kodesh la, Shabbat la Hashem means the deity is taking a rest and he's not going to provide fruit for you. So they panic. But what they learn is what our experience of the Shabbat is, right? Which is that it's for us, not for God. Um, it's for us to sanctify God's name, but it is for us to experience as a good thing. 
But the point here is, it's a process of they're utterly bewildered by this thing. And it, they're utterly bewildered by the mana and they're utter, utterly be, be bewildered by and don't react to it in the way that we would think would be normal because we're creatures of the week, we're creatures of the Shabbat. But they're depicted as, you know, as which is credible. As, you know, here they are, they're, you know, it's completely new to the world, new to them. They're also former slaves. So why would they trust anybody about, uh, um, who's telling them they should you know, not go out and fend for themselves? And so their instincts are to hoard, et cetera. Uh, and so it's depicted as an invention and a particular kind of invention. All right, I'm gonna um, get to my, sum my last slide, which is just a summary. And then I'll just make sure to open up for questions, right? Which is, what I hope to share with you today, I skipped over a couple of things. Some of that stuff is just stuff you can look at if, if, if you want, just to fill out different points. So the story of the Shabbat and the manna, which go together, manna, manna and Shabbat, is like super, super important. <laughs> uh, that's my uh, pathetic way of describing it. Uh, it's much more important, I think, than we give it credit for. It is the paradigm for the... Um, Shabbat, but of the first week, of the week itself. And that's why in the two accounts of the fourth day of creation, the four presentation, two presentations of it, they both point to this paradigmatic first week. And they both point to it in seemingly contradictory ways, but they're actually complementary ways. Because that first week is both intrinsic to, and I would argue in a lot of ways, kind of the fulfillment of key aspects of the Exodus process, number one. Number two, it is a unique experience of God the creator and of our being partners with God the creator. By the way, remember I said at the very beginning, it's kind of weird that a covenantal sort of particularistic relationship would recall a universalistic event. Now we've solved that problem. Because, yes, it recalls the original creation, but it does it through the special experience that Israel had with this first week and continuing. Special experience of God, the creator. Yes, Ramban and the, and the Rambam are right that that part of, there's experience of God, the creator all throughout the Exodus process, but it's in a kind of unique way right here in that first week. And so it makes sense that you'd refer back to this first Shabbat in this way. And by the way, the Rambam is, all, Rambam is also right in his emphasis on the fellowship or equality theme, because that's also built into the Exodus and creation in this way. It's all fused together, okay? Um, and built into that is also this notion, it's like also bringing the week into the world, this invention of the week. It all comes together in this way. All right. Um, I think we are, I want to make sure Kayla, right, um, Kayla is probably going to say this, but we're off next week. Is that right? Yes. For Purim? Yes. Um, it, we will see you. We will not have class next week, have a Purim Samach, and we will meet the following, and we will meet the following. Um, and if you're, you will, you will not expect, do not expect a Zoom link next week, but you will expect one the following. Right. And if you, what I'm going to do next class, next session, what I'll, I'll be doing is really focusing on the narrative. Uh, so part of the, what, I, what I want to share with you is we usually think of Shabbat in very abstract terms. But part of what I want to share is like the experience of that first week is built into the Exodus narrative. Into the, and so now we want to do is actually take it back a little step and understand that panic. They panic at the beginning of chapter 16. What is that panic all about? And how does that help us to understand what's going on in this experience of the Shabbat and Amman. And that's going to be, I think, very instructive as well. All right. And that's what we'll be doing next, next session. Uh, if you stay with us. That's what yeah, you should. I agree. <laughs> um, I could stay on for a minute or two more. I actually have to go pick up my daughter uh, out in Waltham. <laughs> we'll be using um, the same text that you sent us. I'm sorry? We're going to be reviewing some, some of the materials in We're the We're going to be going, going, going over. Uh, what we um, have. Yeah. Thank so, you. but I'll, I will send. There'll be news. There'll be some new sources, but a lot, not a lot of new sources. Um, particular, um, uh, basically, the previous parak. So the events that take place. So it's 
basically what happens when they when they leave Egypt um, and then through the Song of the Sea, the Shirat Hayam, and then there's something that happens to them somehow that they end up panicking in ways that don't really make any sense if you read it carefully. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, and to everyone. Chag Sameach and uh, yeah. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Yep. Chag Sameach. Thank you for your patience in today's technical difficulties. Yeah, Kayla, but... thanks for making it possible. I was worried we'd have to cancel. Yes. Awesome. No, no, we have not canceled. And if you want to learn more with Risha, especially related to Perm, we have a very busy Sunday coming up, um, including a new class, One Nation Dispersed, Diaspora in Megillah and Jewish Thought with Rabbi Silber, Dr. Malka Simkovich, and Dr. Micah Gottlieb meeting at 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The clock is changing. Have a, be prepared for a chaotic Sunday. All right. With that, have a good night and from staff. Bye.